Um, hi everyone. Um, as some of you sort of may know, I'm Maisie and this is Mia. Um, and we're from Panoramic Associates and we specialise in supporting local authority um, across the country with public health recruitment. Um, and sort of one of the main areas that we focus in is substance misuse commissioning and drugs and alcohol commissioning. Um, and we thought it would just be really helpful if we sort of perhaps started um, sort of a breakfast briefing series. Um, so we're planning on sort of once every um, five to six weeks, um, having a number of guest speakers just share insight on a particular topic within substance misuse and drugs and alcohol. Um, and it gives our clients a chance to get together, sort of share insights from their local authorities, ask questions, um, share any challenges and tips, etc. Um, so the structure of this morning's briefing, what well, we've got two guest speakers. We've got Stu Green um, from Aspire um, and we've got Madeline um, from CGL. Um, and both will be sharing um, a sort of 15 minute presentation on a topic of their choice. Um, so I believe uh, Stuart will be sort of sharing insight on Leros and Madeline will be sharing insight on continuity of care. Um, so we're going to hand over to Stuart first. Um, we're going to give sort of Stuart around 15 minutes and then there's opportunity to sort of ask any questions after. Um, what we would say is if, you, if we can just sort of wait until after sort of Stuart's finished um, the presentation and then obviously if you can just sort of raise your hand um, using the, the button thing I think yeah, it's there sure. isn't it okay. yep <laughs> um, or post any questions in the chat um, throughout sort of the presentation and then obviously Stuart can answer them afterwards um, so yeah but we would ask you if you can just sort of stay on mute during the presentation just to sort of prevent any background noise but yeah there, there will be time for questions at the each of, uh, at the end of each presentation. So I'll hand over to you, Stuart. Thank you. Um, so I'll just share this. I'm not going to kill you by PowerPoint. Um, and I'll just, let me just. Um, okay. Hopefully everyone can see that now, yeah? Yes. Great. Okay. So um, I'm Stuart Green. Um, I've got a number of hats aware. So I'm in long term recovery of 23 years. Um, I've worked for the NHS in substance misuse for 20 plus years. Um, I also was part of the initial steering group and the development of the Clearo which is the College of Lived Experience Recovery Organisations. So this is looking at where strength-based initiatives in our communities uh, come from. So I'm a great believer, and I, currently I manage NHS addiction services in the north of England in Doncaster and uh, manage everything from needle exchange all the way through to a medically managed detox. So got a suite of, of services and obviously with all the new monies from the Dame Carol Black report and the 10-year drug strategy uh, and the accelerator monies from the uh, supplementary we've seen the workforce in my workforce go from 86 to 120 I think 126 127 and the challenges in that workforce has been particularly uh, key because the workforce since the the cuts from 2005 in the dip days the drug intervention program days what we've seen is the workforce leave this this arena so it's been particularly challenging and workforce is a, a key priority in our services and the, the development of skilled workforce so today i'm i'm um, i'm talking uh, about leros which is lived experience Rec recovery organizations uh, the, the slide deck i'll ask Maisie to share and my contact details if you've got any questions about it because i appreciate 15 minutes isn't isn't a long presentation so I thought I'd just borrow this from Cormac Russell who um, does a lot around asset-based community development and let's make the invisible visible because what I'm, I'm really acutely aware of is is that if we get upstream and have well communities what we have is less people presenting at our services uh, in need of help and I think it's a, a whole service approach and a community approach Cormac Russell, uh, when he came and presented and did some work with me in, in Doncaster, he said, Stuart, you haven't got a drug problem, you've got a community problem. And that really, really stuck with me. Um, and what I find is, is with, with local communities, the local communities that are most disenfranchised or are struggling the most 
I've got the higher levels of prevalence of substance misuse and alcohol, which to me is a way of that, how disconnected they are from our local communities. The challenge with Leros, and I speak from lived experience and de helping develop a network of Leros, mm -hmm. and I'll come on to that, is how do you commission that? How do you engage with that? Often for statutory services, they're based around health needs assessments. And then what you've got is uh, service delivery plans around gaps in health inequalities, which is absolutely perfect. From a Lero point of view, it comes from a different approach. So it comes from mm -hmm. a strength-based approach. Um, so when people say, is the glass half empty or half full, it's both. Lero is it's half full. It comes from a strength-based approach, and it's about connections, often driven by people that are quite charismatic in recovery and want to do something or make a difference, but isn't necessarily something that's on a POF indicator around health inequalities, okay? But saying that, it has a social value and potentially a social return on investment if you were to look at investing in, in something like this. So one of the examples I find is, is and that's why I opened with I'm in long term recovery is we still we see a lot of illness in our communities. We still we see a lot of visible intoxication. Mm -hmm. We see a lot of people raise concerns to the councils, to services, to the police. And we're going through all this right care, right person at the minute with the police at the moment. And actually, when we look at it, we see a lot of illness, but we don't see a lot of wellness. Now, one thing that does Leros are very good at is showing wellness and how people have, have got assets and strengths in themselves. And what I quickly learned when I worked in the field is, is that as helpers, we often disempower the person sat in front of us and don't give them credit for the strengths they bring to that helping relationship. And I think that is something that is a challenge and how we broker that. Equally, it's a challenge for Leros about how Leros fit in a recovery oriented system of care in your local authority. How do you broker or French, uh, you work with those Leros to develop those links? I wanted to show you a few of the initiatives that I've done in Doncaster. So what some of them was um, in the, um, the detox unit, um, there's also a day programme, a 16 weeks uh, cognitive behavioural programme. And what we do is we, we for people that graduate, they put the handprint on a tree, which shows wellness and visible recovery in there. Um, these are some of the uh, volunteers and mentors will will wear purple. So people that have graduated or choose to come and volunteer, we run an accredited 16-week program, MVQ level three. And the volunteers and mentors wear purple. Volunteers and mentors, we've been on, we've had them in Doncaster probably about 10, 11 years now. It's been challenging at times. They do need a lot of support, but this is a peer-led initiative rather than a peer-based initiative. So a lot of services have got volunteers and mentors, which are peer-led, which are part of that organisation. Usually people that have come through that organisation done particularly well or got particularly interested in putting something back to support that organisation. The beauty of peer-led is, is that if you are wanting a, a patient or someone to go to, a, say, a 12-step meeting and you hand out 100 leaflets about that 12-step meeting, it's an abuse of trees because 99 of them leaflets will go in a bin. Actually, what you need to do is connect them to a peer mentor and then get them to a meeting. So peer mentors and peer volunteers are really, really good. Um, we, we, we get them to wear purple. Um, it creates visibility. It creates stigma busting uh, kind of view. Also, it busts the clinical fallacy when you work in services that if all you see is poorly people coming back to your door, you start believing that people can't recover. So actually having well people that are actually in the service and are visible reminds you that you know, people can achieve uh, independent recovery or sustained recovery. Um, and it's not prescriptive. So I, I do like the, the friends in the box one. Um, this is the recovery oriented systems of care, which um, is lifted from the guidance that OHID has now produced, the Office of Health Improvement and Disparities. And it sort of shows a Venn diagram of how potentially a, a, a recovery oriented ecosystem may work. So you've got treatment services, recovery services, and uh, what we do together in terms of recovery hubs. I think, I think for this, um, You've got recovery support service. Now, some recovery support services can be run by uh, peer-led initiatives. So our recovery checkups are run by volunteers and mentors, and that's part of that well-being checkup process. So 
we, we're really clear about making sure volunteers are supported correctly and their addition to service delivery. And also it's um, it's a bit of the warrior down stuff if you've ever come across that. And it's about supporting people around what happens when they leave treatment services and it's not just a sudden end. It's almost like when when your children leave home, you, you stay in touch with them, they come back for dinners or whatever. So, and I think it's also really useful to understand people, how they're getting on. And we've been through all this debate about representations and this arbitrary barrier of six or 12 months is, as a success or not a success if you represent. So I think for me, it's, it's, it's really refreshing to start seeing that even though that blunt tool of treatment exits is is a measure of some success, it doesn't mean necessarily deem a quality of life, i.e. the five ways to well-being or chime. So this model is in the, and I've put a few links to this if you're not aware of it, I'm sure you all are. Um, and this was uh, this was released uh, two or three weeks ago. So this was what Susie and Laura Patchley from OHID produced and we, we helped them develop this. So this is how it sits in our local communities. And you'll start to see come online, depending on which tranche you are in the accelerator monies, um, the IPS stuff, the individual placement support teams, um, housing support, really key. It's all the Maslow stuff, and I'm sure you all are aware of that, that safety stuff and good quality housing. Um, UK wide. Personally, um, Stuart's opinion is is we're missing a bit of a trick. We've got a lot of um, we've got a lot of hostels, um, which unfortunately aren't the best uh, place to promote recovery. I think there's room for Oxford housing. I do think there's room for recovery housing. Uh, if you look at some of the uh, US um, evidence, so I think housing is really key. But that's safe, safe and uh, drug and alcohol free housing. Um, also, when you look at sort of collegiate recovery, I think on campuses, that's really interesting when you start to look at that as well in local areas. Um, and criminal justice services and, you know, um, having had uh, the pleasure of uh, Dame Carol Black coming up to our services a couple of times, um, she, she put um, a safe bet in with the money um, around the criminal justice sector. And, it's, and, and I know we've got um, uh, a colleague on talking about continuity of care and the uh, the need to look at rehabilitation for offenders in, in terms of that uh, and between the prisons and uh, us. And Dame Carol Black is doing a review with the prisons at the moment or has been allowed to continue to do that review within the prisons. Because I think that where she stopped, unfortunately, fell a bit short when we look at those opportunities of those revolving and cyclical um individuals going out in and out of um of um prison setting or secure settings um i think there is opportunities um and i'm sure you, you i'm teaching to suck eggs on this but in terms of um uh, when you're looking at um contracts around uh, social return on investment joint commissioning or match funding uh, potentially looking at shared objectives and kpis or even sequins attached to different parts and i saw in Dame Carol Black's report, a sequin on mental health to engage with, with people when we look at coexisting conditions and that old chestnut of chicken and egg of, no, it's a mental health, no, it's a substance misuse and the poor, poor sod in the middle is not getting any service and how you look at that no wrong door approach. So I think there is opportunities and I think that that's probably more in, certainly in your gift on this call to look at how you join those conversations up and look at either place-based um, initiatives around that. So Moving on, I, I do like, I find Cormac really refreshing and kind of it, it's a synergy with, with Leros. And I think there's room for it. And I'm a great believer that, you know, um, just like a football team, you're either a junior football team all running around a ball or you're a professional football team playing to your strengths. So when you look at this, this approach here, um, very quickly, you can see everything is done by us. This is the medical model. This is correct. This is nurses, pills, potions, su OST, supervised consumption. Absolutely right in service land. I think when you look at everything done with us, the voluntary sector are very good at this. When you start to move into this space, this is quite an exciting space because it's um, person-centred. Because when we look at this, we we claim our services are client-centred or person-centred. Effectively, we do have waiting lists. You come into a waiting room, you ask to sit down before you're seen. Often, Leros are very person-centred. So they come in, have a cup of coffee. How are you doing? So it's very person-centred. Um, and when you're looking at um, alongside and that support, that community support, that visible recovery and recovery contagion, these two areas down here are absolutely where Leros are. The trick is engaging with Leros. They're often flat structures, charismatic. Uh, their infrastructure can be very um, young, 
Uh, it can be very mature. Is Alira, when it grows up, become a voluntary organisation? You see that with the basement project. You see that with the well over in Cumbria. You see that with building on belief in London. So when you start to look at Lira's across the country, that's that's some of the, the picture. Um, so I just want to talk a little bit about how we got here. So um, the one thing I can thank the pandemic for was actually um, um, Zoom. Because Lero's um, services are very good at structures, organizations, and finding pathways into to different organizations. Zoom gave us an ability to shine a light on the best head kept secrets in our local communities. And it managed to link 33 Lero's up and down England and Wales. We have got Scotland Lero's, but clearly the government structure up there is different. And the way it's commissioned is very different as well. So when we looked at it, we brought in um, Professor David Best. Um, we, uh, Ed Day, the recovery champion, and then a number of Leros, and I was fortunate to join that group as a person with lived experience working in service land for the NHS. Um, <clears throat> we recognise that all Leros uh, are diverse and messy. They don't necessarily conform to traditional commissioning structures or needs assessments, um, but there is a recognition that that social cure, that social power of uh, community uh, strengths, you know, people get treated in hospitals, but stay well in communities. And actually it gives a strength of where people can go. In terms of uh, standards, we looked at the five ways to wellbeing, which you've seen uh, on the previous slide, and CHIME, which is um, a model stolen from the mental health um, um, arena and that's connection hope identity meaning and empowerment which is a great tool to measure how how welcoming organizations are how well services are structured how much care do they give to the people they serve um, and we've worked with our head around developing the guidance which i've popped in there i think what 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 is what is really clear in my experience is recovery isn't linear the reality is it can be very um it can be episodic, you know, uh, statistically, I was told a lot of years ago, people, if you average it out, it can, it can be up to seven times people go around that cycle. Sometimes relapse, a better word is return to substance misuse. And actually, that's part of, of recovery and well being, as in any other long term health condition. What I found was really interesting is this, this model about clinical recovery. So that's your pills, potions, stable substitute prescribing, personal recovery, which is ultimately the driving force that gets you out of bed. Functional recovery is your sleep pattern, eating, nutrition. Social recovery is where Lero's feature. And that um, social recovery, because recovery isn't an individual experience. That's abstinence. Recovery is something that happens between people. So that's the pro-social model of, of recovery. Stigma, the worst enemy of um, recovery. It's a negative recovery capital. We have community stigma about the people due to the visible intoxication and addiction. Also, we have language and somehow we disenfranchise ourselves away from the fact, well, he was a substance misuser and he died. Actually, he was someone's son. He had a name. He's a person. So for me, I think it's language has a big part to play in how we, we look at the community and the community response to how they treat the most vulnerable. I, I prefer community returners rather than ex-offenders. Um, they were never were meant to live in prison. They were meant to be part of our community. And just some examples of different different language. And of course, we're all familiar with the NIMBY syndrome, not in my backyard. And, and I remember opening the detox unit and having pick, um, people with placards marching around it in 2004. And now we, we make Christmas dinners for that local community and wreaths at Christmas. They come in for carol singing and it's all changed because all they thought they would see was needle exchange and antisocial behaviour. So some work we did, and uh, I believe there's about nine now joined up to Recovery Cities that's been driven by Professor David Best. Uh, recently, there was uh, Middlesbrough and I believe Sheffield have joined now. So this is about, um, there's an investment uh, for any local authority in investing in drug and alcohol services and recovery oriented systems of care, because well communities return assets and the, 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 the the people that give more back to a community than faith-based or anyone else are people in recovery. So if you want stuff done, live in the street with people in recovery because they, they will often return that and that's part of their connection back to the chime stuff. Um, and actually, um, you know, if we've got well communities, we've got thriving thriving communities and we've got bigger tables rather than higher walls around our, our, uh, our um, 
uh, our accommodation and, and villages. So I think uh, this was back to what I said about uh, when Cormac uh, came. And I think, you know, it takes a, a village to raise a child. We've, we've all got a responsibility. And I'm sure you've all heard it about either antisocial waste or uh, visible intoxication from the spice days or where you're looking at uh, street drinking. So I, I believe it's we've got a social responsibility in our communities. Uh, as part of treatment services, we, we are part of that absolutely 100%. Um, and uh, and I think that's that that's that. I'm just conscious of the time. And the last bit is is I think just being mindful about community assets and being careful because I know in Doncaster since the pits closed, there's been a number of initiatives from New Deal in communities to um, all sorts of other short term funding. And we've gone into communities, promised them the earth, and then when the money's run out, had to step away. So it's about how do we build those community connectors, those community assets and um, develop it. I believe I'm, I'm about on time. I've also put um, a film for the Recovery Games in there, which um, we hold an event annually in Recovery Month in September. It's at Hatfield Marina. We started uh, 10 years ago. We managed to get 200 people there. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we got 1,000 people there. Dry Wave came, which is sober raving. We had people come from all over the country, even the Isle of Wight, to participate in gladiator-style gladiator events. It's like it's a knockout to Isha's Castle, uh, and it's visible wellness at its best, which was the week before the recovery walk in Hull. So I think, you know, recovery is possible, and we just need, uh, need to believe that actually when you invest money in uh, treatment service it's great but when you invest money in recovery it's exponential because actually recovery capital you get a return on your investment and that space gets bigger thank you thanks so much Stuart um, has anyone got any questions they'd like to ask Stuart at all about anything he's covered just double check oh Gareth um I will yeah Oh, hi. Um, yeah, look, um, absolutely superb. Really enjoyed hearing that. Really outstanding. Um, just wondered, um, the approach that we've taken in Bolton, uh, I wondered uh, how we could engage with the College of um, Lived Experience Recovery Organisations. We've actually set up a, a coalition. We call it a coalition. And it's individuals. It's um, small, informal alliances and groups. It's our existing local recovery communities but it's also uh community groups that don't have recovery written over the door but provide excellent support and, and a place of, of of friendship and welcome for people in recovery we also bring in services to the coalition as well so um i'm just wondering how that could how that could fit with with clear clearo and the lero model Personally, I, I would love to have a, a big conversation with uh, commissioners around that with David and Ed. So that would be something we'd like to do. We set up three sort of levels. So we've got kind of the steering group, which isn't the important bit. The important bit is what you've just described is the actual Leros and, and stuff. But we've also got friends of Leros, which are people that want to be yeah. involved. And we've actually got some commissioners that have got lived experience of substance misuse that are in that friends of Leros. I know that space, we'd be really keen to look at how we support those conversations because in a way part of the commissioning structure and even with the new monies is about sometimes with the big nationals and and statutory services they need to let go of a little bit to give a bit to some of the Lero stuff and when you look at the US approach they've ring fenced some some of that money particularly for Leros so I think when you look at it I think there's opportunity I'll put my uh, email in the chat and if anyone else would like to join that, I think we can certainly set something up and I'd be really keen yeah. to do it because it's one of the, the things that I've found is there's a bit of a firewall between commissioners and the rest of the, the um, e ecosystem really, which m may be fine, but I think equally, I think some sensible conversations could take us quite far. Great, thank you. Well, thanks. Um, Alan, I can see you've got your hand up, so I'll hand over to Alan and then we'll move on to the second presentation. Thank you. Um, I, I was just wondering if I worked for a local authority that was wanting to do a bit of work on um, people as they're coming out of prison and arriving uh, in the community and what the offer could be that local authorities and partners could make to attract people into services. I'm wanting to do that work and I'm wanting to engage with people with lived experience to do that. And I've been talking to people locally and 
um, about how to do that, about people with lived experience locally. Um, and I think we need some support and help and advice and maybe even someone. Uh, is that something that you could point us in the direction of? Definitely. Um, and the well have got some initiatives and they join uh, parts of the departure lounges that have been set up at the prison gate. And I think it's looking at, it supports all the continuity of care, which I'm sure my colleague's going to talk about. So I actually <laughs> absolutely believe it. And also going into the prison. So some of the stuff we've been doing is, is rapid access to rehab uh, straight from the prison. Yeah. Um, even though you're not, you can't necessarily get, um, your contributions are analysed in prison because you're not on benefits. Let's worry about that when you get to the rehab. Um, you know, so actually that that bridging the gap and how we we manage that. So I think yes, definitely. Um, I think that would be very useful to bring into some of the continuity of care meetings that are already happening is that Lero involvement. I'm sure there is some of it happening, but I think the probably sharing some good examples around that would would be really good. That'd be really good if we. Uh, uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll get I'll get details. Um, yeah. But great presentation as well. Thanks. A lot Thank you. But Dave Hyam from the Well is is doing quite a bit, and he's up in um, in uh, the Lake District, isn't he? Okay. Um, thank you so, so much, Stuart. Yeah, I think we're running out of time a bit. So I'm going to hand over to Madeline. Um, but we were more than sort of happy to arrange sort of a, a second talk that can potentially be a bit longer and focus on some of the areas um, that people are interested in um, with Stuart. So I, yeah, I'll pass over to Madeline now. Yeah, and Madeline will be um, discussing the continuity of care side. Um, she's a project manager from CGL. And then Madeline, I'll let you take over from now. Thank you. Oh, you're on mute, Madeline. She's. Oh, no, she's not on mute. You're not on mute. Uh, no, on mute. Not on mute. Um. Look. There. Does that work? Oh, oh yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah, what a start. Um, okay, morning everyone. I'm Madeleine Drummond. I'm a project manager at We Are Recovery in Sunderland, which is um, Change, Grow, Live, provided by Change, Grow, Live. Um, I've been asked to talk about continuity of care and how we do this in Sunderland. We've made some improvements over the last couple of years. Um, I think most services, um, well, we've all got a target of 75% of people returning to the community. I like that. I'm going to use that more and more, returning to the community. Um, to engage in treatment in the community following their release from prison. I'm going to share my screen. Please work. Uh, yes, no. Yeah, yeah, we can see your screen. Oh, you, okay. Let's see if I can play that. There we are. Okay. So, um, the northeast region, so we started, we had a bit of a head start on this actually, we recognised an initiative that was set by Public Health England in 2018 for community and prison treatment providers to work together more closely. So we've had a bit of a five year head start on this. Um, we came together, there's 12 northeast local authority drug and alcohol treatment providers, prison leads, probation service, the Hep C Trust, liaison and diversion and NDTMS leads. Uh, we all came together in one room in Gateshead with a blank bit of paper and just said, how do we do this? How can we make um, the best transfer of care between community and prison establishments? In 2020, again, as Stu said, in response to COVID, we went virtual and, and that's done us a world of favours. It means that we can reach into services easily. Um, we've got that kind of network available to us and we meet every other month as a forum of all of those um, services coming together where we share best practice and we look for opportunities to improve the services um, for the service user, basically what's going to work best for them. What we realised is that the information that was being shared from prison and community was, well, it was nothing. I mean, being that it was only five years ago, we were still using a fax machine and a fax would arrive to say these people are coming out of prison tomorrow please, can you set up an appointment? And that was about it. Um, so we developed a four part sort of transfer of information. It goes from prison to community, from the community back to prison, and then from the prison back to the community, and then the community back to prison. Um, again, I'm gonna go through that form because that really is what's, what's helped evidence the work that's being done. 
It means that there's relevant and up-to-date information and it follows that service user throughout their tra uh, treatment. So if that person moves from one prison establishment to another, that document goes with them. It minimizes repeated psychosocial interventions, uh, which we know increases motivation and engagement from the service user. So when I think the best things that any service can implement comes off the back of conversations with your service users. And what we were finding is that they were coming out, they were doing a piece of work in the community, they were going into jail, they were starting again, so that's already lost meaning. They were then coming back into the community and starting again, and they become exhausted with it, especially for those people that, like the revolving door uh, people, it just loses motivation. They can't be bothered, they're exhausted with, with saying the same stuff over and over again. So we decided that the best thing to do was to share what is happening so that they don't have to start that treatment plan again. They can be picked up sort of where they are on that course of treatment as they move between establishments. Um, it also encourages good communication between the prison and the community providers. So it gives a, a single point of contact, whether it's the person that's been working with that prison leaver in prison or the same um, in the community. And really importantly, which is a bit boring, but it is uh, evidence data compliance with NDTMS. So we can do all of this good work. We can see the people when we're meant to see them, we can engage them really quickly. But if NDTMS doesn't pick that up, then we're not gonna be hitting our targets to evidence uh, the work being done. So this is the form itself. I'll not go into it too much. If you're looking at a laptop, it's probably quite small, uh, but I think we're gonna send this out. Part one is information that comes to us in the community from the prison. So that alerts us that that person is now being inducted and is in prison. And that could be the first that we, we know about um, the person going into prison. So it allows us to close everything down in the community, all the NDTMS stuff, um, so it can be picked up by the prison provider. It gives that reception date, but it also gives a potential release or court date as well. So we can start straight away working towards uh, planning for that person's release. Quite often it doesn't say anything because it's very early on that we get this information. It tells us who that person is going to be working with in the prison. Um, and really importantly, at the bottom here, it gives consent. So again, before we implemented this process, um, if somebody came out of the prison and we just had that name on a piece of paper, we gave an appointment for that person to attend, they didn't come, there was nothing that we could really do about that. So the 21 days that we have to engage the person to hit the um, or hit target was kind of meaningless because we'd have no consent to write to them, no consent to call them, no consent to speak to any of the services that might um, be working with them. So yeah, we added that more recently and I think that's really, really helped in us increasing our um, engagement with people. And it also requests a part two. So this lands with us and then we've got two working days to complete part two. So this is the information that goes from the community to the prison and it's an overview of what that person's been doing with us. Um, the World Health Organization has set a recommendation that if Hep C is eradicated by 2030, and we know that we need to test, find positive cases and treat in order to do that. So BBV status is really important. Have they had a test recently? Are they due a test? Are they Hep C positive? Are they partway through Hep B vaccinations? Um, again, the prison can just pick that up and, and act really, really quickly on it. Some risk information in there. A lot of the times they might not be known to the prison at all. So it's really important that we can protect the, the service user going in, but also the staff that they're working with. Any overdose, any recent overdose, um, any history of, of safeguarding issues or concerns, any current ongoing safeguarding um, forums that they're part of. Any mental health or physical health need. So again, this can identify really quickly for the prison staff to, to know if that person is requiring treatment. Um, and further down what treatment we've been given. So this is where we would document, for example, as the person partway through a course of relapse prevention, you know, have we been doing drink down um, processes with them? Are they going in alcohol dependent? And do you need to look at this person as a potential detox within the prison? Uh, and do, 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 the NDTMS. So this is the date that it's closed within the community. And that's just to make sure there's a, a transfer, a smooth transfer of data um, for us and for the prison. Part three comes further down the line. And this is what's been happening in the prison. It's really, really similar to part two, um, but we're planning release at this stage. So this is where the person has a release date or a court date, so a potential release. And the prison are letting us know what's been happening in the prison. Again, have they been tested for the BBVs? 
uh, what's the outcome of that? Are they coming out with a housing need? So we're lucky enough in our model to have a homeless link worker. So this allows us to set up that first appointment with the person coming out of prison. Um, we'll get our homeless link worker there. We'll get our harm min service there. You know, all the risks that they're going to inform us of. We've got people within our service that can be there at that first point of call that just make that first appointment really meaningful for the person coming out of prison. Um, what substances have been used in prison? I mean, we're not naive to think that they go in there and they remain abstinent. There's a lot of opportunities, we're told, um, for our service users to use substances in prison. And it could be substances that they've not used in the community. Um, so it changes their risk slightly. So we, we ask for that information where it's known. And again, what treatment have they been doing so we can pick up the psychosocial intervention stuff? Are they on a reduction plan with their opiate substitute treatment that they might want to continue? Have they started Bouvidal? Um, they're moved on to methadone mainly in the prison and a lot prefer buprenorphine in the, in the um, community. So are they reducing down in order to make that transfer over to buprenorphine? Just really important information so that we don't have to sit with the service user and start from the beginning again. We've got this information ready for us when they attend our service. Have they been released with naloxone? Really important, we'll always re-offer, but the prison do a really big push on naloxone. Another thing we added more, more recently was our preferred pharmacy. So this is really targeting our Friday court appearances uh, of people who are on opiate substitute medication. For anyone that's worked in drug and alcohol service who, who works with prison leavers being released very, very late on a Friday afternoon, potentially from um, a service down the country, uh, we're expected to take over that opiate substitute medication from the Saturday. Um, we're not a service that's open on a Saturday. We have a Monday to Friday opening hours. So what we do as a kind of backup and on balance of risk after a discussion with a prescriber is to leave a weekend medication, um, sorry, prescription in a seven day pharmacy. So that, that person will have their dose in the prison on the Friday. They're released from court at some point on the Friday. They can't get back to our service before five, but they've given us a preferred pharmacy. So they know on the Saturday morning, they can go their medications there. Um, it's really to reduce the overdose risk of them coming out and using substances in the community to manage a withdrawal because they haven't got the safety net of that medication in the pharmacy. Uh, are they open to the probation service? And again, consent, uh, like I touched upon when we talked about part one, it's really, really important. And this is um, probably the main reason that we've managed to increase our engagement because when people come out of prison, especially our non-clinical service users who don't need that medication day one, um, they've got other priorities, basically. They want to see their family and friends that they haven't seen for however long, or they need to go to housing, or they need to sort out benefit payments, or... You know, so this allows us to give them that little bit of time, but still kind of pull them in within the 21 days. Part four is the final part of that um, document. Um, and that's something that I take charge of. And that's just my control problems, basically. I do need to let this go at some point because it's quite time consuming. But what I do is as I look through um, the two weeks, I do this every two weeks and I look through the releases from the two weeks uh, beforehand and I just quality check right the way through. Have we done everything that we were meant to do? Have we offered the appointments in a timely fashion? Have we been ready and available for those people when they've attended? And that's every part of the service that that person requires. Um, and is all the data and all the paperwork matching up to evidence the work that we've done? Uh, just tick a box, basically let the prison know that that person has engaged um, and how it's recorded on MTD, NDTMS that's sent back to prison and the prison can close it off. And that's basically the, the end of the transfer of care. Um, we track prisons in Sunderland. It's an admin uh, task, depending on your case management system. Some case management systems will allow you to do this. Ours doesn't really. So we have an Excel spreadsheet, um, a bit old fashioned in that way, I'm told, but it's what works for our service. This is managed by admin. And what we do is we have um, a monthly tab on an Excel spreadsheet and we add the release in chronologically on the date of the action happening, not as the referral comes in, if that makes sense. So admin can sit every morning and look at today's date and say, okay, we've got three people in court. We've got two releases that are clinical. We need confirmation of their medication. And it just gives them um, like a work log for that day. It really helps to organize. I think the worst thing we can do for somebody when they've come out of prison is to just not be organized and not be ready because what they need to do with us in terms of 
BBV is naloxone, getting a triage, getting the NDT MS started, getting the top done, getting a prescription generated, seeing a person for a full assessment. It can take ages and they've got these other priorities. So if we can just be as organized as possible, this allows us to do that. Um, and it also allows me to go back and quality check again. We also meet with, um, so in the Northeast, the prison contract is humankind. Um, and so I meet with the performance and quality manager from Humankind monthly, and that's something that all the Northeast services do. And we go through every release over the month prior, um, and I update with the grey bit here, which is just to make sure every bit of the process is done, that their dates match our dates. Um, and we just look for opportunities, really, is to is we, we mainly focus on the people that haven't come. And is that personal choice, which is fine, um, or is it something that we could have done more to engage that person? Um, yeah, so we look for opportunities to improve. In Sunderland, um, I think, so that's pretty much the region. We do that all across the Northeast, but I think in Sunderland, what we do um, is we make sure that we use that continuity of care form to its full potential. I do know that some services use it as a, it's a request for an appointment and there's an appointment and that's kind of it. It sits with admin, it doesn't get delivered to the recovery coordinators who are seeing those people. So the information within it gets lost. We make sure that every bit of information on that form is used for the purpose it's, it's meant to be used for. Um, we make sure our data accuracy is, is on point. Basically we have a data analyst uh, in our model, which is great. And we make sure that our recovery coordinators are trained anytime there's a change in NDTMS. NDTMS doesn't often make sense in terms of dates. It's, it's not something that you could just blag your way through. For example, a referral date for a prison release. It's not actually the date they were referred. It's the date that they come out of prison. So if you've got that date wrong, everything else messes up. Um, so that's really important to make sure everybody knows what they're doing to evidence the work. We have a care package for our um returners to the community um which i'll explain a little bit more and we have a six week pathway so instead of having to rush that person and keep that person in for, for two hours on their first day of release we get as much as we need to evidence that that person is now engaged in treatment and then we see them weekly for six weeks so we can add to an assessment we don't need to know absolutely everything about that person in day one we just need to get them set up build some rapport with them and make sure that they're happy to be coming back to us um, and yeah, the information we can just go through and, and gather it as we go on. And we attend prison events. So we, Law Newton, which is our female prison um, in Durham, we go into there once a month now and we meet the people who are going to be released. I think it's 12 weeks following each event, um, where again, we can just build rapport, find out what's important to them. What are they going to need on release? And just make sure that it's it's not just about us ticking boxes and making sure that we've got the right form filled in. You know, it's about what each person needs. And we try and pull this holistic approach to everybody. Um, our model is really diverse in that we've got counsellors, we've got our in service, we've got the homeless link worker, as I mentioned before. We've got pharmacy leads. We've got everybody who can just tap into that person and look at everything that they need to get them settled into treatment. Um, whilst all the other chaos is going on around them. The care package, I think this has been quite important. So I was a bit cheeky and put a proposal together to our commissioner and asked for some money. What I recognised is in our non-clinical releases, which were the people that were not really engaging, what we would see is they would come to us two months down the line. Um, they'd come out for one reason or another, they just weren't really prioritising their treatment. Maybe they've done some work in prison. They've thought, right, I've cracked this. I can come out and, and I'll be fine. And, and actually, very slowly, they return to that substance. And we see them a month or two out, uh, after their release. So we knew that we needed to kind of encourage that attendance at the beginning so we can get them really, really quickly, get them comfortable in service, even if it's just recovery support that they need and that they don't need a structured intervention, just getting them comfortable coming into us when so that they can reach out at the, the trigger signs, the early signs of um, returning to substance use. So what we can offer each prison release is a gym membership. Again, from speaking to service users, they said they'd been working on some fitness while they were in prison. They were using the gym facilities and they wanted to improve that. Sorry, to continue that when they came out. They just didn't have the finances to do that. So we can give them a four week gym membership. I'm putting another proposal in to see if we can make that longer um, with eight different centres in our area. 
um, a mobile phone and a top up. Really important, especially for people leaving prison who've been in prison for quite a long time. They come out with, with no means of contacting them. It helps us as well. We send text reminders for each appointment. Um, so it just allows them to keep on top of, of when they need to come and see us and contact all these million other services that they need to contact. Um, and a five pound food voucher. So this goes a long way with our people, our homeless cohort um, just to come out. There's a voucher, go and get yourself a hot drink, a hot meal uh, while you're waiting for your prescription or whatever. And we make sure that the DART teams know what we offer. So and we do that through the continuity of care forums and the bi-monthly meetings and just make sure that every service user who's coming out of prison knows that this, this is what's waiting for you. It just helps them to incentivize, sorry, to, to attend. It's a little bit of an incentive, even though I'm not allowed to use that word. Encouragement, we shall say. Um, and that's it from me. Have I raced through that? Perfect. Thank you so much, Madeline. That was really insightful. Um, would anyone like to raise their hands for questions for Madeline? Yeah. I think there were some questions in the chat. So if someone wants to elaborate on their question, I think I saw one for... Uh, from Kerry Bailey, would you like to elaborate on your question? Hi, I was just wondering if, um, and maybe I missed it, is this just for, um, you know, the recovery services and the prisons or is primary care involved as well? You know, do you, is the same process made that the GPs say from their perspective, the physical and mental health and then similarly, are they encouraged um, you know, to coordinate and, and meet the GP regularly when they leave? Um, no. Um, so, I mean, they are encouraged, absolutely. A lot of our service users come out of prison without being registered even with a GP. They come to our area because they've been moved there. Um, you know, they're in an approved premises or, or there's a hostel available here, but they're not actually from our and area. And that's what I'm getting at, really. Yeah. So, yeah. so we, we communicate, um, as do the prison, um, and in terms of informing them with what about what work's being done, um any kind of bbv information or any test results that would go in writing uh, we do that every 12 weeks with the person's registered gp um so we make sure that the information not in that format they don't get that four part form uh, but we do send um updates as do the prison so we'll inform gp when a person's gone into prison and what work we had been doing with them um, and this, the prison do the same, so they will they'll write to the, the GP with updates whilst in the prison. We don't, in, in, I mean, I can only really talk for our service, but we don't really get that back from, from GP, so we don't get that level of engagement from GP around our service users. Um, I know when we've tried to do MDTs before, it's quite rare that a GP could or would attend that, whether there's a capacity issue there. Um, but we certainly make sure that the information goes to GP what they do with it, I can't, I can't say for sure. And sorry, just to follow up. So when you had everybody in a room planning this pathway, mm -hmm. did you include primary care in that? No, I don't believe we did. It was between, it was drug and alcohol treatment providers only. Um, and we don't have, yeah, it, it's where, the way the commission services in this region to do that. So we inform GP, but we don't tend to work with GP. I think Gateshead might be different. They used to work under a shared care model. Um, I'm not sure if that's the same now, but no, G GP, as far as I remember, it was it was the probation, so it was criminal justice rather than health focused at that point. Um, Thank we, you. Do, we do have a primary care lead here in this service, so I'm going to take that thought that you just put into my head and speak to them. How we could do that and cover our whole area geographically, we do have a GP alliance um, in this area. Yeah, I've just, okay, I'm going to put that down here. Thank Karen, you. I think there's a couple more uh, raised hands now. Karen, would you like to go next? Sorry, I didn't mean to actually raise my hand. I was just um, giving a big thumbs up <laughs> to what my brother <laughs> was saying in terms of linking with a primary care lead, because that's the way to do it, isn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, to get that, you know, that discussion yeah. going. Mm -hmm. um, well, I would say that it's been an absolute pleasure listening to some of the discussions this morning. I'm um, Assistant Director in Public Health over in Bolton, so working alongside Gareth. And Gareth quite humbly asked a question about engaging Leros, but he's done a lot of great work in terms of 
growing our recovery assets in Bolton and there's, there's much more to do but we're on the right track um so I just wanted to say a big thanks really to to inviting me in and uh having given me the chance to listen to everybody's presentations and comments thank you thanks for joining as well Karen um so we've got two hands up so we've got we'll go to I'll just go over to um Stu and then Alan so if I yeah, yeah it was yeah. just on the primary care bit because we haven't got shared care in Doncaster and actually, you know, looking at working with the PCTs and how we engage with them. So what we did with, for, um, with the police, we looked at the clear build hold approach and did some pop-up hubs using a street doctor. So by putting the street doctor in and wrapping drug and alcohol services, wound care, hep C, housing and benefits, the street doctor, because it's doctor to doctor referrals, made the... The, the actual practices um, serve the patients that are on their books, actually. So it carried a, a um, so we've popped up in a number of areas, which um, in usually faith-based or voluntary sector places, but that street doctor broke the relationship and encouraged the, the GPs in the primary care uh, around Doncaster to look after the patients that are on their books and not see them as something that only needed specialist secondary care. So I think it, it's just, that's how I've, I've started to broker it. But I go to target days and really struggle to get traction with GPs, if I'm honest. Yeah. Um, and I think wound care is a really interesting one because, you know, um, for a lot of the higher level wounds, the tier three and four wounds, the, the, the practice nurses aren't trained in that. But equally, when you look at it, us, our, our patients don't want to go and sit in a, in a service where the wounds are smelling because they're embarrassed. So it, it's kind of how that, that's tackled. But the street doctor approach has worked really well for us in Doncaster. Thank you. Sorry. Um, yeah, I'm just going to hand over to Alan now, just because I'm conscious of time. Right, very briefly. Uh, two things. One is um, the, the, the offer that you're making, which I, I, I was really interested in wanting to look to see how we can build on that. Uh, do you make the offer to everybody? And when I say everybody, I mean, maybe we're in a particular situation in Wandsworth where as the host authority to Wandsworth Prison, 85% remand, a high number of NFAs are counted on the data as being Wandsworth people. Would you even know they're not necessarily with a local connection? So that local connection thing uh, with no probation involvement if they are out on remand or spent sentence. The second uh, issue is around mental health. And have you um, ex any experience of people being blocked from services because they, from mental health services, which they maybe have been receiving in the prison because they are also uh, still using? I mean, I think every service has had that frustration, haven't they, at times where to try and get somebody mental health support while they're using um, substances. If they've started a mental health treatment in the community, I believe that that is transferred to a community, um, sorry, if they've started treatment in the prison, I believe that is transferred to a community uh, mental health team. So there should be kind of a fluidity there. Uh, we do really have to fight a lot of the time, even just to get mental health medication for our service users that they've been given in prison. They've been given a short prescription when they've come out, they've come to an area that they don't live in, they don't have a GP in. Um, and that's really the, the work that's done by our recovery coordinators to break down the doors to even just get the medication. Um, so a lot of the time we'll have to start new referrals again. We do have um, a mental health lead within our service as well who can help us to do that. Um, I did, when you asked about is the offer open to everybody, do you mean the care package or do you mean? Well, well actually, I, I, I met yesterday with people uh, from, from the community based service because we've got a large number of people with, who are NFA and ones with prison. Yeah. That they're not being supported by the local community support provider because we're not they're not funded to do that unless you have that local connection. But I was also actually yeah. thinking more of the kind of like the broader package around gym membership and and, and, and other things because we're looking to ways to attract people to come to 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 services where it's not a part of any license. Yes, uh -huh, I see. Um, yeah, I mean, so that's open to every prison leaver. I did have a separate bit of funding under public health. Um, 2021 for the the wider service so they also got gym memberships and phones they ran out i'm pushing for more um but in terms of if so are you saying that the local housing providers are saying that there's no duty to support them because they don't have ties to the area 
Well, it's not just housing. It's 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 everything. It's 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 right. um, because you've got people coming out of the, out of the prison with no local connections to it to necessarily anywhere. With large, you know, it, it's difficult then to say who is funded then to support those people. Right. If you're NFA, yeah. and if you've got a large number of NFAs coming to the host authority to the to the yeah. prison, then then that 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 can lead to problems. That makes the, the statistics look dreadful. But yeah. also, there isn't the resource there to to, to fund them. I just wondered whether um, the, the 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 things that you were offering were open to all prison leavers. Like CAS three, for instance, isn't right. Okay, so we so they need. Um, I mean, uh, yeah. So they need an address in our service. Sorry, in our catchment area, area yeah. if you like. If they're NFA, then we need to register them with a GP in our area, which absolutely we should be doing right. anyway because yeah. they need yeah. to access primary care. You know yeah. the thought of people who are homeless and just lost without any you know yeah. eyes on so that allows us to welcome them into our treatment service um as long as there is a gp in our area or an address brilliant okay thank you under our funding no problem yeah. cool um yeah thank you so so much we're literally we've got about one minute left so we're out of time and i know a lot of people have got to sort of get to meetings um but thanks so so much to Stu, and thanks so much to madeline and thank you everyone um for attending uh, we will be aiming to just arrange sort of uh, follow-up or feedback calls with everyone um over the course of the next week just to sort of give us a bit of direction um and insight into the next one that we arrange um i know stuart's already previously mentioned to us that he has um a number of people within his network that he he would be keen to get on board um, to do sort of just a bit of a longer one with us. Um, so I'll keep you in the loop with, with all of that. Um, but thank you so, so much for your time, everyone. Um, we'll send out a follow up email. We'll send out the recording as well um, and information, the presentations from both Stu and Madeline. Um, so, yeah, any other questions as well, just get in touch with us and we can put you in contact. Yeah, thank you very much, everyone. Real. Thank you. Have a great day.